In this chapter, you're going to learn about some fundamental language constructs of GraphQL, such as the GraphQL schema, queries, mutations, and subscriptions. In the second part of this video, I will demonstrate how you can experiment with your own GraphQL sandbox environment to apply what you learned in practice. GraphQL has its own type system that's used to define the schema of an API. The syntax for writing schemas is called the Schema Definition Language, or short, SDL. Here is an example how we can use the SDL to define two simple types. One is called person and the other type is called post. The person type has two fields. They are called name and age and are of the types string and int. The exclamation point following the type means that this field is required. Post only has one field that's called title and is of type string. It's also possible to express relationships between types. In GraphQL, that's simply called a relation. Let's add a relation between the person and the post types to express that one person can be the author of many posts. We first add the author field to the post type. Now every post that is created needs to be associated with a person who is the author of it. Next, we add the posts field to the person type to express that a person can write multiple posts. The syntax to specify that something is a list in the SDL is similar to many programming languages. It uses square brackets. Notice that we just defined a one-to-many relationship between the person and the post types. Let's now discuss how you can fetch data from an API by writing GraphQL queries. When working with REST APIs, data is loaded from specific endpoints. Each endpoint has a clearly defined structure of the information that it returns. This means that with REST, the data requirements of a client are effectively encoded in the URL that it connects to. The approach that's taken in GraphQL is radically different. Instead of having multiple endpoints that return fixed data structures, GraphQL APIs typically only expose a single endpoint. This works because the structure of the data that's returned is not fixed. Instead, it's completely flexible and lets the client decide what data is actually needed. That also means that the client needs to send more information to the server to express its data needs. This information is called a query. Let's now take a look at an example query that a client could send over to a server. The all persons field that you can see in this query is called the root field of the query. Everything that follows the root field is called the payload of the query. This particular query would return a list of all the persons that are currently stored in the database. Here is an example response. Notice that each person only has the name in the response, but the age is not returned by the server. That's because the name was the only field that was specified in the query's payload. If the client also needed the person's age, all it has to do is slightly adjust the query and include the new field in the query's payload. Now the server will also include the age of each person in its response. In a GraphQL query, each field can have zero or more arguments if that is specified in the GraphQL schema. For example, the all persons field could have a last parameter to only return up to a specific number of persons. Here's what a corresponding query would look like. Now the server only returns the last two persons that have been stored in the database. One of the major strengths of GraphQL is that it allows for naturally querying nested information. For example, if you wanted to load all the posts that each person has written as additional information, you could simply follow the structure of your types to request this information. So this is what the corresponding query would look like. The server will now resolve this query and include the list of posts that are associated with each person that is being returned. So now we also see that each person has a list of posts in the server response. 
Next to requesting information from a server, the majority of applications also need some way of making changes to the data that's currently stored in the backend. With GraphQL, these changes are made using so-called mutations. There generally are three kinds of mutations. Mutations for creating new data, updating existing data, and deleting existing data. Mutations generally fo follow the same syntactical structure as queries, but they always need to start with the mutation keyword. Now let's take a look at an example mutation. Notice that similar to the query that we wrote before, the mutation also has a root field. In this case, the root field is called create person. We also already learned about the concept of arguments for fields. In this case, the create person field takes two arguments that specify the new person's name and age. Like with a query, we're also able to specify a payload for a mutation in which we can ask for different properties of the new person object. In our case, we're asking for